Just a quick note before we start the show, we've got two things to share that we want everyone to know about. First off, if you hadn't heard, the Elixir ecosystem survey is out. We encourage everyone to fill it out. It's a community project and all the data will be made publicly available once collected. The survey is open through August 11th and the results will be revealed at ElixirConf. So get your response in before the cutoff, which again is the 11th of August. We'll drop a link in the show notes. Okay, and secondly, we've added transcripts to all the episodes in Season 4. We expect there may be some errors as the transcribers are not Elixir specialists, but the good news is that our website, where the podcasts are hosted, is a public GitHub repo. So if you spot any typos or inaccuracies, just submit a pull request and we'll happily update them. We'll put a link to the repo in the show notes as well. All right, that's it for special announcements. Now here's the show. Welcome to a special edition of Elixir Wizards, a podcast brought to you by SmartLogic, a custom web and mobile development shop based in Baltimore. My name is Justice Epen, and I'll be your host today. I'm joined by my co-host, Eric Ostrich, and today's episode is very special because it is the second half of our special Council of Wizards, a live show that we recorded with a number of guests earlier in the summer. In today's episode, you'll hear our conversations with Chris Bell and Desmond Bowie from Elixir Talk, and then Emily Maxey and Dan Lindemann from Very. Hope you enjoy the show. We were just catching up with Chris about coronavirus coping. How are you doing, Desmond? They finally reopened the beaches here in LA, so that's been a big change for us. Are you making it out there, getting to get some sun, some yeah, vitamin drizzle? I was just surfing yesterday, and I was at the beach over the weekend, and there weren't a ton of people out, but there were more people than I've seen in months, just in one space, and it was a little unusual, you know. <laughs> What's your favorite beach to surf at around LA? I usually go to Venice Breakwater, which is where I live. Probably my favorite spot is up at Sunset, just north a little bit. Nice rolling waves, better for a longboard. I learned how to surf in the very small break at San Clemente, but I've also surfed at Newport Beach, Huntington Beach, just wherever my cousins take me when I'm out there. I love it. Fun. Nice. Yeah. I have also surfed in Colombia, which is terrible surf, but a lot of fun. <laughs> Very cold water. <laughs> LA sounds nice, man. I would love to be getting sun right now. It is just a dreary day here in Maryland. How's it in Indianapolis, Eric? I think it's also dreary. Let me check. I'm in the basement, so it's just a, a, a room with no lights. So I guess it's, Wonderground is saying it's cloudy. And that's, I think, what it was when I came downstairs, so. So this is a pretty special segment of the show because we've got two of the major podcasts in the ecosystem just colliding right now. It was actually, I think, y'all that gave us the idea to even do this live stream because we heard that you were sad that you hadn't been on the show. <laughs> <laughs> so I told, yeah, the backstory there is I told Todd, I was like, well, how come everyone else has been on the show but us? So I was just wondering if there was some kind of anti-Elixir talk is, or something. Is there a beef? Yeah. Do we have yeah. beef? <laughs> Can we all <laughs> beef is clear? <laughs> Can we like stir up some drama in the Elixir community or something? I don't know. I think that's okay. I think that's totally okay. Um, (laughs) This show is a safe space for you to start beef with anyone you want. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, we definitely encourage roasting of your colleagues. That happened earlier on this show. Uh, Who was it that we had on? Oh, yeah. Well, okay. So we got an episode coming out with Amos King. So everyone can look forward to Chris Keithley getting roasted by by Amos. (laughs) Nice. Desmond's like, yeah, we've been waiting for that. (laughs) (laughs) The the elixir beef we've all been waiting for. We don't have a good excuse, guys. I think Desmond and I talked about it at one of the conferences, but it just didn't materialize. Yeah, I told Todd to keep the beef going. At ElixirConf last year, like right at the closing ceremony or whatever, you had said that I would be on Elixir Talk, and then it never happened. So That's true. I actually just realized (laughs) that when we were like coming online. I'm like, oh, shit, I remember that conversation as well. So uh, what can we say? Busy podcast hosts. Yep. And and all that. You know how it is, right? Yep. Yeah. Podcasting is a very hectic, like overwhelming (laughs) industry. (laughs) Super stressful. Tons of pressure. Definitely. I mean, the amount of prep that we did for this show is just unreasonable. (laughs) So much fun. I'm joking. Yeah. But it's cool to have like a mashup. I think that I'd love to talk about doing like more. We get like all the sort of personalities together, especially during this sort of time where people are very isolated. I think it's nice to just have these voices in your ear. I know I listen to lots of podcasts right now. So what have you been listening to? Oh, you know, I listen to the news a lot. Podcasts, 
yeah, I don't listen to a lot of technical podcasts. I'll be honest. I listen to a lot of like news podcasts and philosophy podcasts mostly. Nice. What about you guys? I'm also a huge audible person. I don't know about you guys, if you consider listening to books, reading books. But... I read a lot of books. I'm going to be that awful podcast host that says I don't actually listen to any podcasts right now. So <laughs> That's um, okay. I have listened to a lot of the other podcasts in the Elixir ecosystem, especially. I just fell out of love of listening to technical podcasts at the moment for some reason. I think I go through waves. And then, I don't know, I've just been reading a lot of product startup books. So that's where I've been spending a lot of my time and a lot of sci-fi because we're living in this kind of dystopian future. So you've got to read some good sci-fi to get along with it. Yeah. I find it hard to read. I mean, after a day of looking at a computer screen, my eyes have had enough. Mm. So mm. I've been trying to have hobbies that don't involve looking at stuff mm. or being on the computer, which is tough because everything's on the computer. You want to get into sound production, that's on the computer. You want to get into 3D modeling, that's on the computer. So mm. everything else is, I don't know, where I go is like kind of solitary. Like, oh, I'll get into pottery or glass blowing. Or yeah. I have this truck that I'm working on. I was going to say you could 3D model like in the real world with clay and you know, <laughs> like, you know, like <laughs> sculpture. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. Buy a big block of marble and just start chipping away. <laughs> that sounds quite fun though. Yeah. You sounds should do that. It's a fine hobby. Yeah. I would be so pumped to like just get on Twitch one day and see Desmond shipping away. At the <laughs> I'd like it's a practice. very long term project. Yeah, I want to practice on something not so expensive first. <laughs> Here's an interesting fact: I have a friend that was in the import like export business, and he was telling me that the reason that Italian marble is the preferred marble is just because of like a trade agreement between Italy and the United States, because it would be much cheaper to get. Indian marble. There's, I guess, a ton of marble that you could get out of India, but you just there's some kind of trade agreement or something that makes it possible. So there you go. You can move to India. And if you go to India, actually, here's another tidbit, which is if you go to India, marble flooring is normal. You'll just walk into like an apartment that costs $200 a month or something and three bedrooms and all marble flooring. And you're like, what? What, is, what am I doing here? Why don't we have marble floors in the United States? So, so I was in Italy a couple of years ago, and we were in this old medieval town called Verona. And these towns have marble sidewalks. Mm -hmm. uh, just like huge <laughs> chunks of marble because you know, the Dolomite Mountains are nearby and so they had all this stuff. But you're still thinking, how the hell do people drag these heavy blocks of stone down off the mountain into this town with oxes and wagons? Hundreds of years ago, chisel them out and they were like, no, let's just sidewalks, sure, houses, sure, whatever, like streets. Yeah, just like make it all marble. Why not? It's a different attitude, I guess. I couldn't imagine having sidewalks of marble in the United States. I think it's let, me, let me mess up my hair and then go... <laughs> Aliens. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, are we moving into that realm? Like, I was going to bring up Stonehenge or something, but yeah, I don't know. Talking about I big blocks. Talk about, like, yeah, levers and pulleys. And yeah, we pivot in this whole podcast into a conspiracy theory podcast. Is that what's happening here? My wife and father in law would very much appreciate a pivot into conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Conspiracy theories around Phoenix. Why can't we get Chris McCord on the show? <laughs> oh, wow. Well, he has been on Elixir Talk a couple of times, guys. So I just wanted to drop oh. that in right at the time. <laughs> <laughs> he is a wonderful guest, you know. Actually, I would say with the release of 1.5, you should just hammer him and try and get him on the show. Sounds like he's got a lot to talk about at the moment. So, yeah. Very cool. Thank you for the tip. That's actually really good. I was going to ask. Go ahead. Sorry. What if you pretend he's on the show and have someone else pretend to be him? <laughs> wow. You can't That's see who it is. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> who can do good? Personalities. I love it. Who can do a good uh, Chris McCourt? Or does it just have to be so obvious? And we just. <laughs> <laughs> Would you be our Chris McCord, Desmond? Well, it'd be kind of fun to have like a. I don't know what kind of episode you call it, where it's like. Yeah, I think you take Phoenix in a different direction. We're going to be waiting for Ruby. You can't tell if you're being trolled or not. Oh, yeah. We'll plan an April Fool's episode for next year. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's listening to this, so they won't be mm -hmm. expecting it. I did want to ask you guys, because that's a great tip, and I wanted to ask you guys if you what you've learned, because you've been podcasting a little bit longer than we have. You know, What have you learned? Do you have any tips, tricks, like what tooling do you use? Anything that helps your process and makes the show better? I would say like one of the things that I've learned is people are a lot friendlier and a lot more willing to give you their time than I ever expected. So like 
we actually kicked off and like one of the first episodes of Elixir Talk, we had Jose on the show. Desmond and I were like three episodes in and we were like, oh, let's just reach out to Jose, see what happens. And then he ended up being like, yeah, I'll come on your podcast with zero listeners, you know, so. That's not how it happened. George, we Marais, oh, reached out true. to us because we knew George from the first MPEX. And yeah, that's so- true. Right after we started the podcast, he emailed us, was like, hey, guys, awesome that you have this thing. Do you want Jose? And we were like, oh, sure. <laughs> I think actually doing MPEX has helped us a bit there, probably with some connections and some leverage. So I'm probably just completely not remembering things correctly. But yeah. So what you're saying is we should start a conference. Exactly. Exactly. We need more Elixir conferences. You know, I love the regional conference vibe. We do. I don't know if we still have it now at this point, but at Lone Star, we announced the pop-up conf that we'll do at your company. But for obvious reasons, no one's reached out to us. About that, so. It could be a virtual pop-up conf now. Like that's yeah. great as well. I don't know. Desmond and I have a pretty simple process with the podcasting in general. I don't think we're as organized and as coordinated as some people organizing podcasts. I'm thinking probably you folks are pretty good. We don't always have guests lined up. So sometimes it's just the two of us kind of talking about random things. But Honestly, I've really enjoyed when we have guests on the show and just kind of digging into some topics. You know, it's just people are really willing to give you their time. And there's just so many interesting characters in the Elixir ecosystem. So Mm -hmm. I love it. Is there anyone that you've had on that you either we haven't had on or you think that we need to have on? Desmond, can you think about some great personalities we had on? Who's been a good guest? Uh, Chris McCord. Chris McCord, great. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think Dave Lucia had our most listens ever, which, yeah. no offense, Dave, but kind of surprised me. <laughs> oh, Dave and I have got a friendly Twitter DM thread going. We have had him on the show at least once, maybe twice. Yeah, he was on his own episode, and then he was also on the Toddcast. Oh, uh, the podcast. Which was funny because that was, I think Todd just started working at Simple Bet at the time. So Dave was his boss. So that was a. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I have a question. Why is Todd the one named celebrity around the community? Because he's everybody's yeah. friend. He's yeah, yeah. <laughs> every because he's nice to everybody and everybody likes him. He's everywhere, so I, everywhere I go, someone's like, yeah, "I was talking to Todd the other day." It's like. We're just all on a first name basis with this guy. The really sad thing is that if there's some other person in the Elixir community named Todd, because he'll just he'll never be able to be the yeah. Todd. He's going to go work on Rust. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't belong here. But, I mean, as far as making a successful podcast, and I don't know how successful our podcast is, because again, we don't listen to podcasts ourselves. We don't really work that much at it. We just kind of enjoy hanging out. I think it's two things. I might be off by one here. The first is not trying to seem that smart or interesting. Because mm. I think that can get old very quickly when people are listening to you. And as listeners of our podcast know, we are wrong constantly and make mistakes constantly <laughs> and screw things up. And I think people kind of dig that. I'm sure some people are like, why don't you practice a little more so it's a little more polished? I think it makes for a much better connection with the audience. And I think that served us pretty well. The other thing is having good enough chemistry with your host, if you have a co-host, that they can be like, stop what you're saying, give you the look online, be like, it's time to move on. It's time to do something else. So you have that dynamism. Um, So we'll give you guys the inside sauce. Is that a thing? Anyway, I'll give you guys the scoop on what Eric and I do. While we're in the show, we are back channeling on Slack. Like the, the whole uh, yeah. But he'll tell me, he's like, you need to stop. <laughs> I need to wrangle you in, dude. <laughs> I, I don't think I could do that. And also I have like a really clicky keyboard and so does Desmond. So that mm-hmm. would be pretty horrendous for noise for us. But yeah. So since obviously, except for this live stream, I've been muting myself as I type as well. But we always keep ourselves muted. And then the guest typically just leaves themselves wide open. Mm. That's partially to prevent us typing and butting in and whatnot. So yeah, that's, so that's cool. our production tip, I guess. Nice. Uh, Desmond has an airport near him, which is why you probably hear these planes flying over. So often in our episodes, you hear the planes flying <laughs> over as well. But it adds to that charm. I right? usually edit those out. You do? Usually. I try not to talk over them because then I can't edit it out. But that's You do your own editing? editing? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So in a previous life, I was a musician and recorded a bunch of albums and played a bunch of shows. So I, I came to this knowing how to edit music and how to kind of work on that. And actually, so this is interesting. Here's another thing I learned. It doesn't matter how you edit stuff. Our early episodes, I was going through second by second, adjusting the gaps in between our talks, like fading in, fading out, doing crossfades and tweaking the compression and everything. And then 
I did this for months. And then I met someone that was like, oh yeah, I listened to your podcast on this app that cuts out silences and moves it through at 2x speed. So then I thought, gosh, all my nice sound edits are just being lost <laughs> in this crummy program. So then I gave up. I was like, whatever, it sounds pretty good. No, it's but, funny yeah. that you say that because I actually prefer less production in podcasts that I listen to. Like, I really like it when it just kind of starts and it's just straight through when there's a lot of crossfades and like these musical interludes and everything. I'm like, uh, yeah. I don't want to feel like I'm listening to NPR or something. I want to feel like I'm just listening to a conversation or a lecture or whatever I'm listening. To. I honestly had no idea that Desmond spent that much time and effort on editing. So thank you, Desmond. That's thanks. You're welcome, Chris. <laughs> yeah. So I think, <laughs> the Pareto principle applies to podcast hosts. We're like, in our case, Eric does 80% of the work and I do 20. <laughs> and so I think that that's probably happening behind the scenes for you guys as well. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> yes indeed definitely <laughs> i don't want to say yes but yes <laughs> but it's also nice that because chris is british i don't know if people have picked up on this but he's got a distinctive british. voice which you know matters a lot in this field mm. i look funny but chris sounds nice so I got a face right, yeah, so i'm happy to be doing the voice thing you know we really are mirror images of one another these shows yeah yeah Except for it's like New York and LA versus Indianapolis and Baltimore. So we're definitely <laughs> <laughs> slightly different tiers of cities. What else do you guys have going on? I mean, we could definitely talk about podcasting all day. Uh, we could probably do a whole show on it. I think that would actually be at least interesting for me. But I'm definitely curious what other projects do you have going on? Uh, Lixerland, what do you think is going to come out of this? How are we going to shake out as a community when this whole coronavirus quandary is completed? Yeah. I'm really hopeful that conferences can carry on and we can get back to that ElixirConf, the bigger conferences and the regional conferences. I'm a co-organizer at MPEX along with Desmond, and we just had to postpone the New York conference back in March. We made that decision actually kind of early, but and obviously it paid off there. But we're really hoping that we can get that conference going again in October or November of this year. So just mm. so we can get things back to some kind of normality that we used to have. And to tell you the truth, I love conferences, not because of the talks, although I love watching the talk content, but it's just great to hang out with the community. You know, it's mm. like one of my favorite things to be doing. And mm. as much as I love doing all this virtual stuff, we had actually like a great Elixir NYC meetup in the last week where we did Zoom breakout rooms and this whole thing to kind of bring a social vibe. But it's just not the same, right? It just doesn't have the same ability to kind of socialize with people and have these really great hallway track kind of conversations with people. So I'm really hoping that we can get back to that. And I'm really looking forward to the time where we can go back to conferences and hopefully ElixirConf or something like that mm -hmm. in the near future. Yeah, yeah, when MPEX is back, we'd love to have you on just to talk about MPEX, plug it, get people yeah, yeah, would love to. Yeah, you know, it's our fifth year of doing MPEX this year as well, which is wow. kind of crazy. So Desmond set up and helped us all come together and was one of the founders of MPEX. And thinking that that was five years ago at this point is kind of scary. I don't know where the time has gone, but yeah, it feels really cool to have been doing something for half a decade at this point, you know, to try and make it sound more dramatic by saying decade. But yeah. <laughs> Desmond, what about you? I mean, what's your, obviously you want MPEX to continue. Do you have other projects that you've sort of picked up? When one project gets postponed, I'm sure that you have time that you want to fill. So, you know, lately I've been dialing a lot of that back. I mean, we recently had MPEX LA in February, so that was the thing. Chris and I... We're working on a few projects in the autumn that didn't fully come together. And we've been taking a step back for the podcast the last couple of months. I've really been focused on the startup that I'm at, Pay It Off. We are developing intelligence to help people pay off student loans mm. for many years. And when I started MPEX, I was consulting. And so when you're in that lifestyle of going from project to project, kind of promoting things and trying to meet people, it's a lot easier to build side projects and work on these community events. And I found that now that I'm at a product company, I really want to apply myself to the product company. And I mean, we're pretty early stage. There's four of us at the company we're hiring. If anyone's interested in working on student loans and Elixir app, please reach out to me. But I find that that takes up all of my energy. And I mean, I still organize Elixir LA, the meetup. And that's fun because it's very local and it's a lot more tangible. So... Have y'all gone digital as a part of that? We haven't. We probably should, particularly in LA, because the city is so spread out that if you're on one side of town, you're not going to drive across town to go to a meetup and fight mm. traffic for an hour, hour and a half. It's tough because people, we talk about this a lot, like there's community here, it's just very diffuse. And so it can feel like the community is small, but it's, it's really not. If you were able to get everyone together, it would seem much larger. And I think one answer to that is 
have more teleconferencing, have better ways for people to dial in. I think that is going to be a big boon to meetups in general out of this, even if it is better being in person. I'm kind of glad that meetup got sold. So now something can replace it or it can actually become like a better product. We've got to replace meetup. It is just 100%. an ex- yeah. exorbitant failure. And yeah, I, I've done several, like multiple meetup groups and it's just a nightmare. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. The costs and managing everything and the complete lack of support. It's, yeah. I could envision three products that are like Meetup, but way awesomer. The problem is everyone's on Meetup. I mean, I've talked to other organizers, they got their lists on there and they're reluctant to move off. So we're kind of stuck with it. Yeah. I guess one benefit, if you do get off Meetup and whatnot, then your attendance ratio, a lot of these Meetups, at least in Baltimore, have 800 people. Yeah. 20 of them would show up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah Even I mean, the RSVPs are like, you expect yeah. half of your RSVPs to show up. Sorry, it's right. really hard with free events, having organized past free events and meetups on a regular basis. We see with the Elixir NYC one, the thing that gets the draw is like the big name talks or something like super hypey that people can be like, well, they're talking about GraphQL or one week we had Robert Verding come along just because he was in town and we had a huge draw on that month. But other than that, I think it's really hard to build this kind of regular audience, especially like I think in the city as well, in New York. It's like a Wednesday night. You're going to go and hang out with friends or something and go for a drink rather than wanting to go to a tech meetup a lot of the time. So yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of hopeful about more virtual events. I think they work really, really well. At the Elixir NYC one this week, we had people dialing in from Brazil and Colombia and all around the world. It was really awesome. And I think that's a really great feature, you know? So I think we have a lot to talk about between community building and podcasting and Elixir, which we barely even touched on this time. We are out of time on this segment, though. I want to give you guys a chance to do any shameless self-promotion plugs, asks for the audience. Desmond, do you want to stop? I already pitched my company. If you want to come work for us, work with me, please let me know. Pay it off, right? Pay it off. That's right. We're an API first B2B company building intelligent student loan software that saves people a shitload of money, it turns out, because student loans are terrible. So come help us solve (laughs) a problem. Yeah, I think we'd be remiss not to plug our own podcast on this segment as well. (laughs) So uh, if you have not listened to Elixir Talk yet, well, what are you doing? You should come over, (laughs) check it out. It's a great podcast. We've actually got an episode that will be dropping on Tuesday. Tuesday. With Jose Valim to announce a brand new project, super hypey come and get involved. So you should definitely check that out. And then on a personal note for me, I am going to be looking for some more Elixir consulting work. I'm stepping out of a role that I've had for a while at an early stage startup, and I'm going to be doing a lot more kind of consulting in the community. So if any folks need help, want some experience Elixir kind of help, I have been doing this for quite a while at this point. I love Elixir. I love talking about Elixir, as you might expect. So yeah. You can get in touch with me at Twitter. I'm twitter.com forward slash cjbell underscore. All right. Thank you so much for coming on the show, guys. We'll definitely want to be having you on again soon. All right. And coming up next is our conversation with Emily Maxey and Dan Lindemann from Very. Let's jump back in. So, Daniel, you're in. Is it Dan or Daniel? Dan. Dan. Sorry, Dan. My middle name is Daniel and my whole Uh, family calls me Danny. And so I have like one aunt that calls me Danny. And then my brothers, if we're yelling. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) People, When you're a Dan, they just decide what they want to do. Different generations, they'll call you Daniel. They'll call you Danny if they think that you're tight. They call you Dan if they think that you're like a blunt instrument. (laughs) Yeah. At Varian, we have several Daniels that go by Daniel. And Mm -hmm. so I think a lot of the times at work, people will default to saying Daniel. But then for five minutes, they're like, oh, no, that's Dan. It fits it's better. It makes it worse. But I guess my question was going to be that, are you guys already full remote? Some of you are remote, obviously remote for quarantine. Yeah, we are full remote and have been so since even before I joined. Yeah, the office was formerly in Chattanooga. So there are several Chattanoogans. But even then, there were several remote employees. So yeah, I've been working from here for my entire tenure at Barry. And Emily, you being in Chattanooga, would you normally go into the office or is this... We had an office until December of 2018 wow. and then just decided it was used by maybe seven employees out of 50. And it was nice to have a home base, but it was just not worth it. And honestly, I love working from home. So mm-hmm. this has been obviously very disruptive for a lot of people, but I think our team has been disrupted the least. 
yeah. at least professionally. Yeah. So it's, like, <laughs> it's a different story. But I mean, when I was looking around, the fact that Very was fully remote was one of the biggest draws. I remember meeting Jeff, our director of engineering at Beer City Code, and I kept looking at Very's job page because it was very, very interesting. But I, you know, I was talking it over with my partner. We'll do you, Chattanooga, is that a thing? And then the spot changed to remote and I applied, I think the day that it changed on the website. So, yeah. And the rest is history. That's it. (laughs) So maybe we're coming in a little bit late with this kind of question, but I'm sure there's still people out there that are kind of new to working remote and still getting their, I guess, feet wet. Is that Mm -hmm. right? saying what works for you like what are the strategies that you've adopted over time maybe what's like the most difficult lesson to learn so that way you can help someone leapfrog that challenge i think for me it's interesting to talk to people who are just going remote and they're like oh my goodness are you on zoom calls all day and no (laughs) we have a few meetings but i'm not on zoom all the time i'm getting work done And so I think that that desire to pack your day full of meetings, I think is a trick that is easy to get in that trap, especially if your manager's not used to not being able to see you and things like that. Mm. But for us, we really protect our time and try and give everyone heads down focus time. So that's a big thing, I think. Mm. Yeah. I would mention too, to people who are working from home because of the COVID pandemic, I've been working from home for almost three years. And I'm going to parrot something I heard Scott Hanselman say, which is right now, this is not normal working remote. You are trying to get work done from your home during a pandemic. The stress of the whole situation affects different people differently. I mean, even myself, like, and I've been used to this. I know this. I have, you know, this nice home office setup that's you know, far away from distractions at the home. And, and even, you know, for me, there are challenges. There are new things, right? You know, with my partner working from home, I now have an open office plan. Um, it's interesting it's difficult for remote workers i mean setting real physical boundaries and all kinds of reminders like lighting and things like that like i will say goodbye as if i'm going to work every morning as i walk upstairs it's like bye see you later it's just exactly the same as when we would head out and drive to the office so this is really interesting so eric and i smart logic was mostly in baltimore Eric was our one full-time remote employee. And then about a year ago, I went full-time remote and I kind of worked on and off remote my whole career almost. And then we brought on someone else that was full remote. So we sort of slowly started moving to this full remote world before COVID happened. Then COVID happened. And I will say the biggest change in my work has been after a meeting, people will just want to stay on and like chit chat. And I'm like, no. <laughs> like, I don't have time for this human interaction. I've worked, it. but no, I'm just kidding. I've actually enjoyed it. I've enjoyed that being normalized a little bit. Wherein, like, when mm-hmm. half the team was in the office, I don't think it had occurred to them that, like, hey, maybe like Justice and Eric would like to just kick it uh, for five, ten minutes after a call. And so, yeah, that's been the biggest change I've noticed. Yeah, I remember when I went for my first remote company, I'm a very outgoing and social person. I'm like always at events. I describe myself as like a conference junkie. So you can imagine like how the pandemic is taking a toll on that kind of personality, right? I remember my friends and family asking like, are you sure that you can work from home without all the people and such? (laughs) It has been kind of nice because I do get a little bit, you know, I do want to leave the house and go out and do things after work. It's actually probably improved my social life. (laughs) <laughs> because I don't get over socialized too much at work and I can kind of save some of that up and say, hey, you know, what are we up to? Obviously, currently a little bit different, but that was kind of a fun difference. It's a little bit easier to be present with someone when you haven't been with someone for a long time. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. One of the recent things we've started that hasn't been used too much, but we did like a spring cleaning thing for our projects this Wednesday. We made a Discord for just the company. It's like, don't text chat there. It's only there for audio. Just join and then you can hear people. What Most of us have mechanical keyboards. So you just hear... Yeah, yeah. You hear someone go, oh, damn it. Yeah, that was pretty fun. I, I enjoyed the, at least that day. We haven't done it too much yet, but it's a nice way to still keep some semblance of an office, I guess, in these times. Yeah. Eric, do you think that there will be like, you know, there's rainy mood where you can just hear rain sound effects? Do you think there'll be like a clacky mood? So like, you know, there is. And I know this because my wife, she found a playlist somewhere that's got a bunch of ocean waves and rain. And one of them is mechanical keyboard. So, okay. Well, I'm going to have to grab (laughs) that. That would drive me nuts. 
Yeah, me too. <laughs> There's some like weird specific stuff. There's one that's like you're in a library. You just hear soft voices and you hear doors closing and like <laughs> the vent going off. It's a bizarre set of things, but they should call that madness inducing. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Maybe it's just because, I don't know, maybe you said Grand Rapids, Michigan? Yeah, Grand Rapids. Or in Chattanooga. I mean, I don't know how spacious these places are. I've never been to other city, but, you know, I'm out in the woods kind of. And so the rain today was the thing. The birds every day are the thing. My dog mm. sort of like thumping its tail into the wall is the thing. I feel like these are soothing. <laughs> okay, if like doors opening <laughs> freaks me out. <laughs> yeah. At least Grand Rapids is like the second biggest metropolitan area in Michigan. So normal city sounds-ish, but I'm kind of on like the north side of the city next to a big park by a river. So that sounds lovely. And Chattanooga is on a river too. It is. Yeah. I'm a bit outside of the city, but I have a lot of green space in my backyard, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Have you done any like home office, like improvements, tweaks during this time? Not during this time. I haven't. Except for lighting, because on days like today, I'll turn mine off. It's just like this two face thing based on where I sit. So, anyway, yeah, that's one thing. We really pride ourselves in being best practitioners of remote work. And so, every person who comes to work at Barry gets a bonus when they join to outfit their office. And then every year we get a stipend to be able to make improvements to our office and stuff like that. So as soon as January came, I bought some bookshelves and really organized <laughs> stuff. So we've got some questions coming in from the chat, but I do want to Ooh. dive a little bit more into this question of like, maybe not during this time, but what were some big wins in developing a home office work arrangement for you? Like maybe dual monitors is an obvious one, but anything else? A door um, that closes. <laughs> from yeah. the rest of the yeah. house oh okay <laughs> i don't know i don't know what people do when they don't have a room that they can just close off from the rest of the house i think i would really struggle yeah i think for me because we do so varies an iot consultancy and there's a lot of little gadgets and things and in, in an office or a cooperative working space you don't get the ability to kind of spread out and make a mess um, but i get a lot of creative juices going when i'm just like spread out at a desk and I've got different components all set up and thing wires are everywhere. Yeah, it's just really space. I mean, I thought it would be, and there are definitely challenges to having a company that does a lot of hardware and being all remote from each other and having the same lab you might have, but everybody sort of has their rendition of a lab, some basic kit, you know, soldering iron, things like that. But yeah, that's the one thing that I really like is being able to spread out and not being worried about taking up too much space or making too much noise. I'd often said that I'm the reason that open office plans are a nightmare, uh, which is why I work remote. So uh, you don't have to be bothered by uh, me and loudness. But yeah, definitely that's a big benefit. All right. So the question we've got in the chat here is how do you get new coworkers to get to know each other when they join a remote company? That's a great question. So I think part of it just has to do with the way that we work. So we're an agile consultancy and we have daily standups for each project and even the parts of the organization I'm in marketing that are not doing development work. We still have standups and different check-ins and things like that. So we also always have for every meeting video has to be on. And so I think that makes a big difference. So you get that face to face. There are other social things that we do. We do remote game nights and remote happy hours, things like that. So there's an entire team of people that work for us called the Remote Commission, whose job it is to think about what should we be doing to provide a more consistent, coherent onboarding experience for the different teams. I mean, as an engineer, you're probably on just one and only one project. As a project manager, you might have two clients that you're working with and you know, your day looks a little bit different. But they're the ones who are focusing on they basically take everybody's input, but you know, they're really thinking about it. So it's like any integrated in initiative, right? If you don't have somebody thinking about it, well, then it's just not going to happen. And so that's our approach to it, which was elect a group of people to primarily think about that. And they have regular meetings and, and yeah, there's like fitness challenges. Yeah. I mean, all kinds of stuff, right? Yeah. I'm curious how game night goes. We've been kind of talking about doing this at Smart Logic, but we haven't pulled the trigger yet. So if you have any tips, like I'm still trying to visualize, do I get my own board? Does someone have like the board with the camera pointed at it? So we piloted it with a remote trivia night where 
a kind of like trying to have it be like if you go to a bar and you have a trivia night, and your table against another table. So split people out into teams and then have each of those teams have their own video chat and then the master video chat. We started doing it before Zoom had their breakout rooms. And so we had a Zoom video and a Slack video and all of these different things. But I've got a blog post about it on the very blog that I can share with you because it's a lot of fun. It takes a decent amount of work to coordinate, but it's a lot of fun. The idea that's popped up is Jackbox, I think is what oh, yeah. it's called. Yeah, yeah. yeah. my friends are doing that. What so is it? That's, <laughs> I missed something. So I've never played it. I've seen people play it. The one YouTube thing I watch, they post that every now and then. But I think it's a one person screen shares and then everyone has it remotely on their phone. Even if it was in person, it would be the same way. But it's just like a trivia thing. And then hilarity ensues. <laughs> yeah, it's my friends and I played it when we would go on cabin trips or beach trips, stuff like that in person. And so moving it to remote has been easy, but you have it on a TV if you're doing it in person. And they have different games from Jackbox is the name of the company. And one of them is a trivia murder party, which is like murder themed trivia, (laughs) not questions about murder, but it's hard to explain. It's very fun. And one of them, you're trying to guess how many people surveyed responded to a certain question. So like how many people prefer grape jelly to strawberry jelly or something like that. And you try and guess. And so everyone's on their own device answering things. And it's a lot of fun. You should look into it. Was that how all the food battles started? I don't think so. Okay. All right, cool. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Another one I actually just got tweeted at by somebody that works at Codenames because my Mm -hmm. friends and I found an online version of Codenames that isn't the officially endorsed one. I mentioned it on a popular tweet and then they were like, how about you try the official one? I feel a little on glass, but that's been really fun from friends. There's also unofficial cards against humanity, but probably not for work, but, you know, <laughs> if you need to join with your friends. I think I might be the only person in America that's kind of disturbed by this whole like true crime fascination the whole world is possessed by right now. So that sounds like a lot of fun and we definitely are going to have to try it. We are about to close out the segment, but we'd love to give you guys a couple of minutes to talk about Very or any personal projects, any shameless self-promotion plugs, ask to the audience. Now's a good time. So the floor is yours. Yeah. So our engineering team is full on board with Elixir and we found it an incredible niche filler. So as an IMC consultancy, you basically take full stack and then you extend the stack out even further. And so the fact that Elixir fits in in firmware and it can talk nicely, you know, with NIFS and C libraries, the fact that it can talk nicely or that it can be nicely embedded as a web app on a NURBS project, you can have like a little Phoenix app for configuring things. The fact that it's just as useful for any other regular API or backends, good way to fill in a lot of slots that are not obvious to fill in otherwise if you're doing multi-development, it gives us things like an over the air firmware updates, which is not baked into, or at least is still being worked on for a lot of other frameworks and a lot of other ways to handle firmware. So yeah, we have found it to be incredible for getting your productivity forward. And that's kind of why we're really working with and on Nerves and Nerves Hub and the power that it gives us, the ability to make something very, very quickly, in some cases for our clients has been very surprising because often the clients that we get, there is you know the internet of things, right? They either are good at things or they're good at internet or they have an idea that they want full bore the whole way. And the fact that we can use it on either half or all the way through, and we can use Elixir and have a familiar, normal setup to go and do things has been a huge boon to our entire engineering department. So I think that's why I was excited to join you all today. And it's really cool. And you can learn more about Very at verypossible.com. That was a very excellent plug. Are the Very puns just unstoppable in every meeting? I think. When people first start, they get real excited about them. And then once you've been here a while, you're like, oh my God, not again. So that's been my experience at least. Yeah, naming things is hard. And yeah, my favorites still are calling something very good. So like, it's the quality that we could produce. Whatever that quality is, it's very good. You know, you can make your own individual assessments of it. That's the only one that doesn't get old for me, but. Oh my yeah. gosh. This is <laughs> Which um, I think they're excellent personally, but. I love it. I love it. I'm definitely the pun proponent at Smart Logic. <laughs> yeah, I get fired regularly for it. So. <laughs> I can't confirm this.
Up next is a conversation with none other than Alan Voss. We are dropping this in as a bonus because Alan runs a series of bot programming challenges and we thought it would be awesome to have him on the show to promote a recent event that he hosted. So please enjoy the show. Connect Four is a solved game. Sure. Okay? So you could just program the winning algorithm. Of course. <laughs> um, and if you go first, you should, if you do it right, never lose. <laughs> yeah, you can program it such that you will never lose. If it's playing itself, it'll tie out, right? Sure, 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 yeah. sure. It was one of the, I think maybe it might have contributed to me feeling so excited about Elixir that, like, since obviously doubled down on the language to the point that we have an awesome podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is that Connect4 demo led to this live stream. It's in, in some ways. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a strong argument to be made. And everyone should check out that blog post because there's photographic evidence of our win <laughs> in that blog post. Now, which leads us to the real story here which is normally we have a segment at the end where you can plug what you want to plug but like let's talk about it now what's coming down the pipe as far as bot competitions yeah so i have another one coming two weeks from yesterday june 4th and maybe justice and eric can include this in the show notes but I definitely have a link to that for anybody who'd like to join us all are welcome hopefully i'll be ready for more and more attendees this time completely ready but yeah we're gonna do another game night now as for what the game is i'm keeping it a mystery except for i'm going to release the name of the game not the repo but the name of the game approximately one week before. So people will at least be able to think about it a little bit. This game is more complicated than Connect Four by quite a bit, but I think it will be really, really fun. We have done, I think this will be our fifth or sixth game night at the Kansas City Elixir Group. We've done, let me see if I can list them off. We've done Connect Four. We did Battleship, although we called it trademark free naval warfare or something like that to, you know, <laughs> not get sued by somebody. And then we did a blackjack. We did a capture the flag. That was really fun. That was one of my favorites we did last time. That was back in October. And if you search Twitter, you can probably find a video of the results of that. Sean Cribbs did the scenic and I did all the back end logic. And then we had quite a few attendees at that one and quite a few submissions. This time I'm hoping, I'm not sure I'm going to pull this off, but I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to make this a double elimination tournament instead of a cumulative everybody plays everybody. First, I think that'll be less resources. And second, I think it'll be more fun to watch because maybe we can bet on who wins in each quartile bracket or something like that. That could be entertaining. But yeah, we're going to do another one. And we'd love to have people. And I would love to have both of you and everybody so, listening. It won't be any of the games that you just mentioned. We're not playing not Battleship or... Connect correct. Play. Correct. We're not playing any... Is it uh, going to be trademark free banker, whatever, <laughs> monopoly. It, <laughs> it will be a game that probably most people will have played. I'm guessing you probably won't have played it since you were a teenager, but it's a teenager level <laughs> game. At least that's when I got introduced to it. Okay. So it's not, what's that game where you have little cards with faces on it and then you have to guess who? Oh, guess, guess who? who? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wonder how that would go. That would be kind of fun. You Maybe like we'll do that for the next one. <laughs> yeah. Just text-based guessing. <laughs> Just describe the person's face, match keywords. <laughs> and then your bot would have to actually answer questions from the other bots. That could be interesting. But at least if you have a set number of 30 cards or whatever, at least it wouldn't be impossible. That could be, that's an interesting idea. I like it. But no, that's not this one. That is not this one. We've got some comments coming in from the chat. I'm going to skip the one that's complimenting my bow rack in the back there. We have a question about open AI. AI's code generation, which I'm vaguely familiar with, but I'm not technically familiar with. Adcron says, Alan, I'm driving across the country, but got on just so I could hear this. And I'm pretty sure Adcron is Amos K. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That is Mr. Amos. He got on just for you. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. He, he also uh, said that he's going to doubly eliminate justice, which is <laughs> patently false and absolutely not going to happen. And I would like to see you try, Amos. 
<laughs> and then he wants to know if it's Risk. It is not Risk, although that was one of the games that I considered. And then I thought, man, that is way too complicated of a game to do an hour and a half. <laughs> I um, would love to do it. If you ever do Risk, I'm in. Risk is probably my favorite game. I could just sit there and play for hours. I got to do Bot Risk Legacy. So you, the world state alters between games. <laughs> I'm not familiar with that at all. I've definitely played tons of Risk, but I, I'm not familiar exactly with what you're talking about, Eric. Risk Legacy is you play 15 games of Risk, and after the first one, you don't have to do this all at once. It's meant to be played over time. But okay. so you play your first game, whoever wins writes their name on the board and places a sticker on it. And so like the game is forever altered. Like You get to name a continent whatever you want. So I think when I won, I named the Europe Oceana or whatever. And oh. so like you get to name continents and you rip up cards and you actually change the games. So like the game that I have in my board game shelf is completely unique and is based on the 15 games that we played as a group. And once you've done your 15, you can keep playing it and whatnot. It's pretty fun. And there's like secrets. When you open the box, there's four sealed things. It's like, don't open this until these events happen. When someone nukes a thing then you can pop open this box and whatnot it's pretty fun wow that sounds significantly more complicated than the regular <laughs> game i'm guessing i've played 500 hours of risk in my life my good buddies andy and chris they just absolutely adore it and we actually have an annual game that we play in the spring that we didn't this spring for obvious reasons but i guess we could have done it online so no excuses no excuses but yeah it's a fantastic game i know a lot of people are access and allies snobs and look down upon risk and there's too much luck in risk and there's significantly more strategy in access and allies but i'll take Eight double six rolls as the defender any day is one of my favorite things <laughs> on earth. So if you're going to be a strategy snob, you have to just go all the way to chess and call it a day. Yeah. Or go. Also, yeah. Well, see, so go. I don't know if go is as strategic as chess because go is more intuitive, if that makes sense. That's fair. You can stick with the World War II theme and go to Advanced Squadron Leader, which is like tiny little chits and you replay battles and whatnot. Oh, wow. And the rule book is like this thick. <laughs> Adkron says diplomacy is the best risk like a game. And yeah, diplomacy is cool. I'm also a risk proponent. Risk is of this category of games. Risk is my favorite. But I mean, chess is a different category, I think. I think risk lends itself to more my personality. I'm significantly more extroverted than as are some of the people that I'm on the call with. As an extrovert, I think risk is great because I can interact actively with people and trash talk like nobody's <laughs> business. I don't have to constantly be thinking on exactly what I need to be doing. I enjoy that from a people dynamic standpoint. Whenever I start getting into those games that are crazy detailed with super tiny pieces, I start eye rolling a lot after about an hour and I'm just over it. So anyway, you consider yourself a Meritrash player. That's the name the board game community has picked for like, you're just rolling a bucket of dice and yelling at each other and having fun is. <laughs> Sounds good to me. I'll take that title. Sounds like the whole point. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I mean, I'm the kind of guy who wants to play taboo and Pictionary and that kind of thing. Not, Oh gosh, what's that one ticket to ride, which is, Oh my gosh, that's just so involved to me. Anyway, that's what makes the world beautiful is that it takes all kinds. Yeah. Well, we didn't say it, but I was thinking earlier that the hardest hit in this coronavirus is extroverts. Totally. And I've had to really adjust my life a lot from that perspective. I have two children, so I'm not running around gallivanting or anything, but it certainly helped to occasionally go to the neighborhood bar, sing a song of karaoke and have a beer. Those days seem to be gone, but you know, not forever, hopefully. Hopefully not forever. It's a different world. Agreed. I miss it. And I don't even know what ElixirConf looks like this year, but, you know, they've already canceled Strange Loop, uh, at least the live version. So does that mean we're going to be Zooming ElixirConf? Like, I don't know. As of right now, it hasn't been announced as such, but that'll be an interesting question because I know tons and tons of conferences are going away. As Mr. MC of ElixirConf, I would think you might have a heads up if that were changing. So, you know, I don't have any inside information to give you. I know that Jim was asking on Twitter not long ago who would be in to attend ElixirConf if it went forward. And I don't know if we got a definitive answer from that. I'm going to look it up right now. Yeah, they keep announcing sponsorships so something is going to happen i have to imagine <laughs> yeah it's tricky everybody's predictions in this matter even as high as the cdc's are this is an extremely uncertain time so as for the capability of us to get together with 540 people 
to do a conference. I don't know. I'm sure a lot of people, even if it was live, wouldn't come just because of the circumstances. But yeah. I've gone to four Elixir comps in a row. So this will make me very sad. If that's the case. Would you go if they had it? I'm still considering that. I'm probably on the fence on that one. I'm not quite sure. Technically, that would be before stay-at-home efforts at our company have been lifted. So there's a potential that my company might not want me to go. So I'd have to ask. September 1st is the earliest day that people in San Francisco at Postmates will be returning to the office. So that's but you're uh, not in San Francisco. I am not. I am not. But we're all trying to be unified as a company and have the... <laughs> Well, I will go if they have it for sure. I will drive across the country. Oh, I've got plenty of Southwest points, but yeah, I would totally go. Even if it was just me, I'm seeing I can't <laughs> empty room. <laughs> Making you, it. Jim Freeze, and Tigers. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, we could socially distance. I mean, it would be cool. I'm a big proponent of like outdoor stuff. I just think like move things outdoors. It's good. Get well, out. there's plenty of room on that gigantic campus of a place we went to last year. That was a yeah. massive location. Right. So maybe that would be possible. Do you think Eric Tolson will pair with me again on game night? He is already RSVP'd, yes. So I he has uh, a partner. I'm sure he would love to have a reunion with you, Justice. That would make me so happy, especially if we won again. It would be such, we would just, <laughs> you would never hear the end of it. Yeah, we'll I'm, get sure. <laughs> I'm sure. What else do you have going on? You have any like cool side projects, elixir things that you're working on that you want? It looks to share? like Eric is in the stream. We have an E Tolson that said, "If you want." Oh, okay. There you go. Yes, I want. <laughs> Which he's watching, so he can hear that. But I posted Smart it. Logic <laughs> Podcast matchmaking. That's awesome. <laughs> any side projects? Well, the current side project is this one. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been working on this for probably averaging an hour and a half to two hours a day in the evenings after the kids go to bed to try to get this for the last month and a half even. This takes quite a bit of love and dedication, but other side projects? None at the moment. I think if I were to pick up another Elixir side project, it would probably utilize Raspberry Pi and Nerves kind of stuff to do some interactions with my stereo system that is proprietary and uses some kind of IP protocol to do communication because the controller for it is dying. And so I'd probably have to do some Wireshark sniffing to learn the protocols. And that's been something that's been in the back pocket someday. Is that the best use of my time? No, I probably should replace the amplifier, but I hate replacing things that work just fine. So uh, that might be something I do next, but I don't know exactly. I think you could turn all your GameBot frameworks into a book probably. Well, what I have thought, not necessarily about a book, but I've definitely thought about trying to make them live viewing all of them and make them comparable to code names or the code names phenomenon that you guys were talking about previously. Make it so that people can play online during Corona because I have programmed all the logic for it. So why wouldn't we do that? So that might be something that I talk to some of my fellow Elixir folks about slapping a front end on this. There's actually someone local to indie did a risk-like game that I think you just switched to live view. So maybe that's of interest to you. Yeah, I'm going to attempt to live view the one that I'm working on right now. I've never done it before, so this will be my first crack at it. But I mean, I can HTML. I can make GeoCities looking sites all day long. The most unattractive <laughs> things you can ever imagine. But I might do something like that to at least make it so that it doesn't have to be done in the terminal. Because the Connect 4 that I did was all using ANSI Unicode characters that looked like game pieces for red and blue. And so it made it so that you could do it in the terminal, but it was at least a little awkward from a user interface standpoint. So the people watching, I've got the, it's, it's called Sengoku Elixir, Sengoku-Elixir.herocraft.com. So you can, I think this is all live view, but yeah, anyways. Well, we're about done on time here, Alan, but I want to give you another chance just to close out, get the final word on a plug and ask for the audience, shameless self-promotion for anything you like. The floor is yours. All right. The only self-promotion that I'd like to do is that Postmates is hiring and we are doing very well during this pandemic. A delivery is very much in demand. So if you are interested in working at a company that definitely has quite a few Elixir programmers, the exact count was probably be somewhere around seven or eight out of 150. But there's a core group of extremely smart engineers. You'd learn a ton from us. We'd love to have you reach out on LinkedIn or whatever, and we'd be happy to talk to you about opportunities. That's the only plug I need to make. Oh, and please come to our game night. So <laughs> June 4th, Kansas City Elixir Group GameBot Night on Eventbrite. I posted the link in the Twitch 
chat and we'll probably tweet out a bunch of links and stuff like that afterwards. Alan Voss, everybody, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, guys. It was a pleasure. Elixir Wizards is a smart logic podcast. This has been an episode of our Council of Wizards live stream. We're always looking to take on new projects here at Smart Logic, building web apps in Elixir, Rails, React, infrastructure projects using Kubernetes and mobile apps using React Native. We'd love to hear from you if you have a project we could help you with. Don't forget to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast player. If you're listening to us on Twitch, subscribe to us there. If you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe to us on YouTube and hit that like button because it's good for the algorithm. You can also find us on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. So add us on all of those. You can find me personally at Justice Epen. That's at Just Use A Pen and Eric at Eric Ostrich. And join us again next week on Elixir Wizards for more system and application architecture or the next time we host a live stream Council of Wizards. Thank you.